Secretary of State for Scotland, Alex Cunningham. Number one, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government is committed to tackling poverty so that we can make a lasting difference to long-term outcomes. This Government has lifted 400,000 people out of absolute poverty since 2010, and income inequality has fallen. While the Scottish Government has powers to tackle poverty through the devolution of skills, education, health and employment programmes, it is important that Scotland's two governments work together to address this critical issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Scotland, it's estimated that one in four children, that's 230,000 of them, are living in poverty, and this is substantially higher than in many other European countries. And like poor children everywhere, these children are likely to achieve less in school and are more likely to suffer chronic illness and poor mental health. And yet, the Institute for Statistical Studies predicts that child poverty could rise to around 37% by 2021. Does the Minister not agree that it is Tory government welfare policies, such as the two child benefit cap, zero hour contracts and the dreaded universal credit that are contributing to the increasing rate of child poverty in Scotland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. He won't be surprised to know that I disagree with him. Since 2010, there are over 3.8 million more people in work and 730,000 fewer children growing up in workless households. Over three quarters of this employment growth, Mr. Speaker, has been in full time work, which can be proven to substantially reduce the risk of poverty. But I know how passionate the Honourable Gentleman is on this issue. I'd be very happy to meet with him to hear his concerns. Tony Lloyd. Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, the, the, the Minister has got to reflect on his answer. Yes, of course he's right about the growth of employment, but the majority of children in Scotland, 230,000 of them, are living in families with parents in work. That's a, a disgrace. Now, what is the Minister, what is this Government going to do about it? Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. We don't want to see one individual, family or child in poverty. And the Honourable Gentleman talks about in-work poverty, and we are taking action as a government to tackle in-work poverty. Real wages have risen for over a year, 22 months in a row. Total wages rose by 3.2%. The national living wage rises to 8.72 in April, and we want to go further, Mr. Speaker. And that's why the Chancellor has announced that the national living wage will rise to £10.50 by 2024. And we also have a focus through our network of job centres around in-work progression. Murray Black. We already know that children living in poverty experience poor physical and mental health, employment difficulties, stigma, and chronic low self-esteem. And this creates problems not just for the individual, but for government further down the line. So I wonder if, if the Minister would uh, surprise us all and actually welcome the Scottish Government's introduction of the Scottish Child Payment um, later yeah, yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah. Well, Minister. I, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. and I am looking very closely at this measure and its impact. And I would gently suggest to the Honourable Lady that this is, in fact, evidence of devolution working. I would say, Mr Speaker, there is no monopoly on good ideas. And where the evidence suggests that a measure works, then we should, of course, explore it. And I will. And I would just stress, Mr Speaker, I am committed to working with the Scottish Government to improve the life chances of people across Scotland, as I am across our whole United Kingdom. Where would like... I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer, and even more, if this is evidence of devolution working, I would like to remind them that this is why we want devolved all of the welfare powers yeah. to the Scottish Parliament. Um, but once rolled out, this uh, new payment will help roughly around 30,000 children out of poverty. So, if this is a good measure for the Scottish Government, can you tell us why his government is not following suit? Here, here. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think I've probably already answered that question. That I will look at it uh, very closely. But what I would say, Mr. Speaker, is if the Scottish Government is serious about addressing this issue of child poverty more broadly, then it should be making full use of the powers to reduce housing costs, improve earnings, and enhance social security. Now, Mr. Speaker, as I said, the Scottish Government has powers to tackle poverty through the devolution of skills, education, health, and employment programmes. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, the UK Government does welcome the Scottish Government's child poverty strategy, and we look forward, and I indeed look forward. To working very closely with my counterpart in the Scottish Government to ensure that we cover these devolved uh, areas. David Mundell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The child uh, poverty payment is welcome, but does the Minister not share my concerns that the vast uh, number of powers 
in relation to welfare matters, which the SNP and Scottish Government argued for, which were transferred in the 2016 Act, have not been taken forward. And in fact, some of them are now delayed until 2024. And isn't welfare just another victim of the Scottish Government's obsession with the Constitution and not focusing on the day job? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank my right honourable friend uh, and recognise his huge expertise in this area. All I would say, Mr. Speaker, is that the Scottish Government and indeed uh, the, the, the Government um, do want to address these issues, and I am absolutely committed to working with my counterparts in the Scottish Government to tackle child poverty and, in fact, poverty in all its forms. Cut, Smith. Number two, yeah, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. With permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions two and eight together. My department has regular engagement with the colleagues in Bays on a range of issues relevant to Scotland, including the renewable energy sector. Cat Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Scotland has a huge geographical advantage when it comes to wave and tidal energy, with reports suggesting that up to 40,000 jobs could be created in the sector if it had government support. Can I ask what work has been done in government to explore wave and tidal technology? Sir State. Thank you. Yes, you're absolutely right, and we do have an advantage on that, as we do in, on wind and, and obviously wind speeds and, the, and, and our mountains, and also, and also uh, with hydro schemes. We have advantage on all those things, and the government is supporting technology at universities. There's technology being invest, investigated into for wave and tidal, and we're completely behind that. Should it prove to work? Christian Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My honourable friend from Lancaster is absolutely right about the geographical advantage. What work is the government undertaking in terms of infrastructure, for example, interconnectors and storage, so that that clean green energy that Scotland is able to generate can be shared with the rest of the United Kingdom? So, go stay. Um, the, as you know, that's, the interconnectors are a devolved matter, but it, we absolutely are looking at up, as best we can to upgrading the, the schemes. Across, so that we can transfer our power across the United Kingdom, and the advantage that we have in Scotland renewables and our growing renewable industry can benefit the whole of the UK. Tony Lloyd. That, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the Secretary of State will recall that when the EDF were given the licence to, uh, to develop the wind farm at Niat Naguia, ten miles off the Fife coast, they, the commitment was that there would be created 1,000 jobs making the jackets for those wind turbines. Can the Secretary of State tell the House how many jobs have been created? No, because I don't know the answer. But what I can tell you, <laughs> and it's a perfectly, and it's a perfectly, stra that's a perfectly straight answer to a straight question. But what I can tell you is the sector deal aims aims to create 27,000 jobs by 2030. That's what the sector deal states. Lloyd. Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll tell the Secretary of State how many jobs. A thousand in Indonesia. Now, can the Secretary of State tell the House? Um, if the GMB union is right in saying that, that the transportation of these wind turbines from Indonesia to the Fife Coast will be the equivalent to 35 million cars on the road, how does that fit our commitment to greening this economy? But what confidence can people have in Scotland that jobs in a wind farm 10 miles off the Fife Coast will be created for people in Scotland and not people in Indonesia? So well, stay. well that, that is the market economy, and we need to be better, we need to be better at pricing and better at producing our turbines, and that is and that's the straight answer. I mean, these and many other issues we will discuss when we bring COP26 to Glasgow later this year and ta to discuss the climate emergency, but I do not dispute with him. Bringing turbines from Indonesia is not the answer. We need to find a better way of efficiently delivering them in the UK. Cole McCartney. Thank you, Speaker. Yeah, 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 Thank yeah, you. Yeah. We are 13 minutes in, Mr. Speaker, and I'm tempted to ask the Secretary of State, and it is to do with wind, because it was a windy day on Saturday, um, about the result when we won the Calcutta Cup. <laughs> oh, come on. You've got to be happy with that. But I'm not. <laughs> the question was about wind, and, we, um, and we, we've had some balance of payments deficits, and the fact that lots of wind farms in Scotland get paid not to produce any electricity. Is that likely to take place later on this year? Secretary um, Obviously, I disagree with him on the Calcutta Cup point. <laughs> it goes without saying it was, a, it was a wet and windy day and a miserable day at Murrayfield for me. Um, as regards, I mean, the, what we're trying to do is improve the way wind works for Scotland. Contracts for difference allow certainty to uh, the investors, it allows certainty over the longevity, it protects the consumers. And, Mr. Speaker, I'd further add that in October 2019, 
when we did the last round of contracts for difference, six of the 12 awarded went to projects in Scotland. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can my right hon. Friend update the House on what untapped capacity there is for using renewables in Scotland and how many jobs would be created as a result of uh, enhancing that cap- capability? Well, there is, a, there is a normal, enormous capability, not just with more wind, offshore wind schemes, but also with more uh, schemes around hydro. And we do intend to create, as I said earlier, 27,000 more jobs through using that untapped capacity. Angus Brendan McNeill. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, offshore wind and uh, contract for difference round three was cost free <coughs> to both the government and the consumer as the strike price was below the typical wholesale price, but 240 megawatts of that remain stranded because off Gem demands that the island of Lewis has at least three, uh, 349 megawatts to build an interconnector cable. There were another 180 megawatts that could have been consented to, it would have been cost free, but they weren't consented to due to government caps. Can we have some joint up thinking in the government between the interconnector and the contracts for difference to ensure we're not bellowing out uh, fossil fuels and we could instead have 600 megawatts of wind being produced? Yeah. The Honourable Member for Nihilin and Yarm makes a very fair point. And, and one of the things that I think the UK should look with future infrastructure and shared prosperity is about building that interconnector. James Sunderland. Number three, please, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Secretary of State. Busy day. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Speaker, with permission, it appears I've woken a few people up, Mr Speaker. With permission, I will answer questions 3 and 12 together. Scottish exports to the rest of the UK increased in 2018 by 1.2 billion to 51.2 billion. As a result, the rest of the UK continues to be Scotland's largest market for exports, accounting for three times the value of exports to the European Union. Given the Minister's assessment, will he confirm that Scotland's trade with the rest of the UK is worth more than three times that with the EU, and this is only one of the benefits on offer of being part of the United Kingdom, not least for British firms? Mr Speaker, the Scottish Government's own figures show that Scotland's most important trading partner is the rest of the UK, and that is worth... As my honourable friend said, more than three times the trade with the other 27 EU countries combined. In other words, the Scottish Government's figures show that over 60% of Scotland's exports go to England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And indeed, I would argue, Mr Speaker, this is just one of the many benefits that Scotland has from being part of the United Kingdom. Rick Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will my right honourable friend, given the excellent figures he has just given, share my concern that the separatist agenda peddled by the SNP is a direct threat to Scottish jobs and it would inevitably end up if they got their dreams come true in a hard border. I would absolutely agree with my honourable friend, Mr Speaker, that Nicola Sturgeon's separatist agenda is a real threat, is a real threat to Scotland's jobs businesses and the economy. And that's why I'm against the First Minister's demand for another independence referendum, because we want 2020 to be a year of growth, stability and opportunity for Scotland and for the whole of the United Kingdom, whereas the SNP want 2020 to be a year of more political wrangling and wasteful debate. Ian Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Labour MSP Monica Lennon has introduced the period products bill to the Scottish Parliament to give free provision to women in Scotland. It is being opposed by the SNP Government because of tampon raids from the English into Scotland to steal the products. If that is the case, what kind of border does the Secretary of State be required in the event of an independent Scotland with a separate currency, a different regulatory environment, and different provisions on trade. Well, the honourable gentleman makes an exceptionally good point, and that is a border we need to avoid. And it makes no sense in having any sort of border between between Gretna and Berwick. And as to the SNP opposing that and that opportunity to reduce VAT rates and other things that would would help people, I, uh, people on the poorest incomes, I simply don't understand what they're thinking. Mr. Carmichael. The Secretary of State truly values the trade between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Why is he prepared to countenance a situation where we would lose frictionless trade between Scotland and Northern Ireland? Ah. Ah. As, 
As the Prime Minister said, there will be unfettered access between, between Scotland and Northern Ireland and indeed the rest of the United Kingdom. Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Yeah, yeah. Question four. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Scottish Secretary and I regularly meet with the Secretary of State for Defence to discuss a range of issues of importance to Scotland, including maritime security. Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Minister's own constituency, he will understand that there is an obvious breach point in the high north of Scotland for adversaries to come into, which has happened before. Can he assure the House that he will be engaging, the Scotland Office will be engaging fully? with the upcoming Integrated Defence Review, and will he agree to meet with me to discuss some of the issues that are important to him and to the rest of Scotland? I would be delighted to meet the Honourable Gentleman, and we can continue this discussion about the great investment by the UK Government into Scotland, into Murray. Last week we welcomed the first P-8 aircraft, the Pride of Murray, touchdown at Kinloss, the first of nine, huge investment by the UK Government and Boeing, and I have to put on record as well the outstanding work that local firm Robertsons have done in building the Poseidon facility. David Dewey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister update the House on what discussions he has had with the Ministry of Defence in terms of fisheries protection, not just, not just an enforcement of fisheries, but uh, on monitoring as well? Well, well obviously, yeah, that is a devolved issue, and I know DEFRA and other departments are in continued dialogue with the Scottish Government and others on this issue. But my hon. Friend's uh, long-standing commitment to the fishing industry has again uh, been raised in this House, and I know he continues to stand up for his constituents in Banffenbuchan on that subject and many others. Ronald Jowell, Wardener. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Number five. Yeah. <coughs> Next day. The UK government ministers and officials have regular discussions with the Scottish government on matters of importance, including the Scottish fiscal framework. Mr. Speaker, this historic arrangement delivers one of the most powerful and accountable devolved parliaments in the world, and it is up to the Scottish government to use those powers wisely to further increase the economic prosperity of Scotland. Ronald Jowell, um, uh, does my right honourable friend agree that uh, the Scottish government's decision to make Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom is not only regrettable, but yet another broken promise by the SNP? <laughs> Mr Speaker, it goes without saying that I agree with my honourable friend. It is disappointing that Scottish taxpayers earning more than £27,000 will pay more tax in Scotland than they do in the rest of the UK. And I'd further say, Mr Speaker, on earnings between £43,500 and £50,000, taxpayers in Scotland will pay 41% in income tax, compared to just 20% in the rest of the UK. And that means that a police, a police officer with 10 years' experience, mid-30s, bringing up a family, on earnings between 43500 and 50000 will pay 21% more tax in Scotland than the rest of the UK. Murray Bellows. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Secretary of State acknowledge that for the third consecutive year, more than half of Scottish income taxpayers will pay less tax than if they live in the UK? Can he explain to these UK taxpayers why his government is ripping them off? I would say to the Honourable Lady that that figure of less tax is correct, more than about 56%. Of Scots will pay less tax, and, bef- and before, the, before the Scottish nationalists get over jubilant, I would point out that that's the grand amount of 40 pence per week. Which Jones? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now we've left the European Union, we are free to determine our own future, and we want 2020 to be a year of economic and social growth for Scotland and the rest of the UK. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Secretary of State has already stated in the Chamber today that the UK internal market represents the majority of Scotland's total export market, which means it is vital that the Secretary of State makes provision to develop and strengthen it. So, can he confirm today that the Government will prioritise the UK internal market over any future US UK trade deal the Prime Minister wants with Donald Trump? Mr. I, I absolutely can because the UK internal market is so important for this country and Scotland. And not only the figures the Secretary of State has already mentioned today, but Scotland does 1.5 times more in trade to the rest of the UK than it does in the EU and the rest of the world combined. Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The financial services sector is a major. 
major employer in my Chelmsford constituency and a major employer in Scotland. Will my, my, will my honourable friend ensure that all parts of the Scottish economy are preserved and cared for in our future trade negotiations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, absolutely. The future of Scotland's economy and the UK economy will be buoyant as we have left the European Union. We want to ensure all our sectors continue to thrive, and I can assure the Honourable Lady that we in the Scotland Office will do everything possible to facilitate those discussions. Pete Sharp. With the response you have heard from the front bench today, might explain why he has lost half of his Scottish colleagues, why the SNP is at 51% in the polls, and why the majority of the Scottish people now want independence. But in the real world, the Chancellor of the Duchy of, of Lancaster says border checks are now inevitable for almost everybody because of their disastrous Brexit. How will this help Scottish business? Minister. Well, the Honourable Gentleman speaks about the real world. Let's look at the real world in Scotland where the SNP are in power. We've got bridges that people can't get across. We've got hospitals that they can't open. We've got an education system failing. This is a record that the Scottish Government and the SNP will have to go to the people to in a little over 15 months' time. And I look forward to that election when the result of that will impact on what the Scottish Government and the SNP have done to Scotland since 20, 2007. Seven, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Thank you very much. I'm busy today, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at the end of uh, 2020, we automatically take control of our waters. This opens up a sea of opportunity for our fishing industry in Scotland and across the United Kingdom. As I've said before, this government will work tirelessly uh, with our fishermen and coastal communities across Scotland. Speaker, can my honourable friend confirm that by becoming an independent uh, coastal state once again, we'll be able to deliver a better deal for fishermen across yeah, the United Kingdom, yeah, yeah. and ultimately we will control who fishes in our waters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can confirm that we will no longer be bound by the EU's outdated and unfair method for sharing fishing opportunities. We will set our own fishing quotas based on science and decide who can fish in our waters. And I have to say I share my honourable friend's optimism for the future of our industry, and that is an optimism I have heard time and time again from fishermen and fishing communities the length and breadth of Scotland. Stephen Bonner. Can the Secretary of State reveal of the UK Government's stated intention of agreeing a mechanism of cooperation within the EU on fishing will include an extended agreement of access to waters as part of an EU trade deal? Clearly, Mr Speaker, we are in discussions about this going forward, but I have to say we have a positive vision for our fishing industry in Scotland now we have left the European Union. And how does that reflect on the vision of the SNP for fishing in Scotland? to take us back into the European Union, to be shackled once again by the common fisheries policy, something many Scots and many fishermen voted comprehensively to leave, and the SNP wants to put us right back into it. John Stevenson. Uh, number nine, Mr Speaker. Secretary of State. I have regular discussions with all of my Cabinet colleagues on important issues uh, around Scotland's economy, including the forthcoming budget in March. The Government will deliver a budget for Scotland's businesses and Scotland's people, it will set out ambitious plans to unleash Britain's potential and level up across the nations and regions of the UK. John Stevenson. Uh, given the close economic relationship between the south of Scotland and the north of England, particularly within the borderlands region, will the Minister give his support and make representation to the Chancellor in support of a free port at the Carlisle and Lake District Airport? Yeah. So, so I welcome the recent free ports announcement, and I have no doubt that free ports will unleash the potential of our proud historic ports, boosting and regenerating communities across the UK. And, my, and myself and other ministers on the front bench, and the Chancellor is here, have heard his early representations on behalf of his airport and, and his area. And not only is the honourable gentleman, my honourable friend, a great champion for the borderlands. He's also a great champion for Carlisle and the Lake District Airport. Hello, Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Page 64 of the 2015 Statement of Funding Policy document confirms that HS2 should have 100 per cent market consequences for Scotland. Will he uh, ask for these market consequences to deliver in this budget, which is roughly £750 million of which we spent today in high speed two? So 
So I'd say to the honourable gentleman that the, but there already has been a Barnet consequential around HS2, HS2 spending. And the next round, in the spending round, we will see what money is allocated to the Department for Transport, and that money will have an, a, a Barnet consequential. Wendy Chamberlain. Uh, oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Over the weekend, Kings Barnes Distillery in my constituency won the best Lowland Scotch 12 year, years and under at the World Whisky Awards. However, the impact of US tariffs continues to impede growth of the Scotch whisky industry in my constituency and across Scotland. Will the forthcoming budget include provisions to help our distilleries compete internationally despite these stifling tariffs? Well, I know the Honourable Lady has a lot of experience in this, having formerly worked for Diageo, and I would say to her that these tariffs, these, these ta- 25% tariffs on malt whisky, are a consequence of the Boeing Airbus dispute between the EU and the USA. And in the next carousel, we hope to get, by having useful negotiations on US and on a US trade deal, we want to get those tariffs removed. We now come to Prime Minister's questions. Do-